Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The prepared natural tooth is lubricated with Duralay lubricant so that the Duralay will not adhere to the natural tooth. 0 0.030 orthodontic wire is cut so that it will extend one millimeter out of the pinhole. This one millimeter extension is roughened with a gemstone so that the Duralay will adhere to it. Utility wax is placed on the other end of the pinhole. This will aid in holding the pin in the pinhole. The pin with the wax on the end of it is placed in the pinhole and pushed to place. Subsequently, the other three or four pins are positioned and you can see all four pins in position. Next add small increments of Duralay using the paint on technique so as to join the three pins on the uh, pin ledge preparation together. It is important to use only small increments uh, be, so that the material does not run down onto the gingival tissue and act as an irritant. After the three pins have been joined together, use Duralay to build up the incisal edge. It is important to protect the incisal edge or the thin enamel on the incisal edge so that it will not fracture uh, in the interim while the bridge is being constructed. As we are adding the final increments of Duralay powder and liquid to the incisal edge, we can uh, use our finger to push or mold the material into the proper position. When we look at this from the incisal edge, uh, we can see the buildup from the incisal and the protection the Duralay mixture is then teased down the distal groove of the cuspid preparation. And it, it is important at this point to try to an, establish a contact between the distal of the cuspid and the mesial of the bicuspid. More Duralay is added across the incisal groove of the preparation. And another increment of Duralay is teased down the mesial groove. Finally, the mesial and distal groove and the pins are all joined with Duralay. The distal labial aspect of the cuspid tooth is also protected with another increment of Duralay. And more Duralay is teased over the incisal edge of the cuspid so as to protect the thin delicate enamel uh, rods of the uh, cuspid tooth. Here we can see that uh, we're adding a little bit more Duralay. The lingual surfaces of the acrylic temporaries are trimmed with a fine gemstone. The occlusion is checked using articulating paper. And uh, one can see the high spots on the restorations or on the temporary restorations here. These are removed again with the small gemstone. One must take care not to grind through the uh, acrylic restorations into the preparation for we have already taken the impression and if we would go through we'd alter the uh, preparation. The occlusion is again checked with articulating paper and the additional removal of acrylic m may be necessary until such time as uh, contacts are evenly found both on the restorations and the adjacent teeth. Using a rubber Kratex wheel, the lingual surface of the pin ledge temporary restoration is polished. The incisal ledge is polished. The same procedure is carried out for the cuspid tooth. The occlusion is again finally checked. And one can see in the final temporary restoration, the incisal edge is protected, the total restoration is covered, the acrylic is saw off of the soft tissue, there is good distal contact with the cuspid tooth, 
and the incisal edge of the cuspid is protected. In the construction of an anterior acrylic impression tray, a relief area must be supplied in the anterior portion of the tray over the impression pins so that the impression pins will not hit the tray. If the pins hit the tray, it is possible that an inaccurate distorted impression will result. Place two or three thicknesses of asbestos over the teeth on the cast. Three or four extra thicknesses of asbestos are placed over the area of the abutment preparations from which the impression pins extrude. If the pins hit the tray, it is possible that the pins will be bent or the teeth will be fractured around the pinholes due to the force placed upon them by the tray hitting the pins. You note the extra thicknesses of asbestos in the anterior portion of the tray. Uh, the tray has been properly e extended for by asbestos. The centric stop areas on buckle non-supporting cusps. The acrylic is mixed and the tray is constructed. You know the notice the centric stop areas in pencil on the buckle non-supporting cusps. Also notice the relief area in the anterior portion of the tray for the pins. On the external surface of the tray, it, again, it is easy to see the relief area for the pins. The tray has been supplied with a handle to allow easy removal. Rubber base adhesive is painted on the tray and over the peripheries of the tray. And you are now ready to take the rubber base impression. Before the rubber base impression is taken, pinholes are to be drilled in the cuspid and central incisor. There are recesses in these pre-prepared teeth that will house the pin. When drilling the lingual cingulum pin, care must be taken not to place the pinhole too close to the lingual surface or the plastic will fracture. This is also true with preparing natural teeth. The line of draw of the pins is the mesial and distal groove of the three-quarter crown on the cuspid. And we will carefully survey the draw of that groove before we drill our pinhole. We'll also view the draw from the anterior view and from the lateral view on the central incisor. These pins will be drilled in the same sequence as on your extracted teeth. When the pins are in place, they should all have the same line of draw as the grooves on the cuspid. The stops for the tray are re-examined to make sure that we have stops on the non-supporting cusps. These stops are visible on this tray, and these will hold the tray firmly while the rubber base impression is setting up. We'll try this on the model to make sure there is enough room in the anterior part of the tray to make room for the pins and that the stops are correct. The rubber base is mixed and is injected around the pins very carefully, being careful not to include air bubbles in this impression, very carefully injecting around the pins, down the, along the cervical, along the slice, making sure there is sufficient light-bodied rubber and then on the cuspid, we will start injecting at the bottom of the groove. And this is done in order not to, again, entrap air in the groove. Down along the cervical, around the pin, and then the mesial groove starting at the cervical, injecting upward, and covering the entire preparation with the light-bodied rubber-based material. When there is ample light body material, then the pins are tapped to make sure they are seated all the way in the preparations. And then a tray with the heavy body rubber is placed over this, carefully seated until it is seated on the stops, and this is allowed to set up. When the rubber has set up, the tray must be very carefully removed in the long axis of the pins 
if they are bent or if they're, they are torqued, they can fracture the very fragile uh, preparation. The pins will usually come out, in the, out of the impression and will remain in the prepared tooth. This is no problem because the pins are perfect cylinders and they are grasped with a hollow beak pliers and placed back in the little orifice in the rubber base impression. It is important that these pins are seated all the way because should they be sticking out a little bit farther, then the hole in the die will be longer than the natural tooth and the resultant bridge will have pins that are too long and it will not seat. So it's important to make sure these pins are in the proper hole and they are seated all the way. The cuspid is also checked and if all the pins are in the proper place and we've recorded all the details along the cervical and the impression, then we will silver plate the impression. This is a thiokol rubber base impression that must be thoroughly washed and dried after removal from the mouth. We wish to wash off all saliva and hemorrhage so that the silver powder will adhere to the rubber base. Using a very minimal amount of silver powder, we burnish the silver powder into the dye, making sure that we cover all of the areas that we desire to be plated. After we have thoroughly covered those areas we wish to be plated by burnishing it in, we blow off the excess material. To eliminate having more plating than is necessary, we block out those areas that we don't desire to be plated that have been covered inadvertently by silver powder with wax. You can use either a red utility wax or a base plate wax or a hard blue wax, whatever you desire. Carefully apply the wax around the periphery of the teeth and over the edentulous area. If the margins were extremely thin, it might be desirable to stay away from them until after the second step of plating is completed. This would eliminate any deformity of the margin due to the wax cooling and warping them out of shape. We've completed blocking out the areas that we don't desire to be plated, and we've left several tails up here that will engage the rubber, I mean the wire uh, connectors. We'll now apply our wire connectors. If the wires are bent in opposite directions, they'll retain the rubber impression better when it's immersed in the solution. One wire goes in one direction and the other wire is applied in the opposite direction. And this will lock them in place so that we can pick the rubber impression up without it falling off. It'll now be necessary to add a little additional powder to make a good connection between the wire leads and the dusted impression. We're now ready to immerse our impression into the plating tank.
carefully immerse the impression into the solution and a minimal amount of bubbles will be trapped in the dyes. After it's submerged, take an eyedropper, fill it full of the solution, and carefully remove any bubbles which may have been trapped in the impressions. After this is done, turn on the plater, and with three dies, we'll set the milliamperage at 30 milliamperes. For each die or edentulous space that's to be plated, use 10 milliamperes. This will be left in the plater for approximately one hour. After the one hour initial plate, the impression is removed from the tank, thoroughly washed and dried. At this time, we can inspect it to make sure that all of the areas are plating properly. The plate should be a milky white, as you see in the film. If there are any areas that are not plating properly, at this time, we can go back and reapply some silver powder to these areas. We would also block out these leads to the wires at this time so that we don't get any excessive amount of plating. A little additional wax will insulate this area and permit us to be frugal with the amount of silver that we use. After this is done, we'll again return the impression to the tank and plate for an additional eight hours or until we've built up a thickness of approximately one half to three quarters of a millimeter of plate. It's necessary to have this thickness, otherwise the silver plate has a tendency to fracture away from the acrylic inner part of the die and we may lose a margin. We're now ready to return the impression to the tank, again blowing out the bubbles and resuming our plating operation. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.